So as we come to the end of our semester together, I'd like to look back and help us identify for each of us individually, what are the big ed tech ideas for you now compared to the beginning of the semester? And if you're beside someone else who's interested in this, please sit down, pause this video, and just talk about what some of those big ideas are for you or those big issues. What are the what's the most important one for you? and what makes it a big idea or a big issue. So again, if you're with someone you can talk about, go ahead and pause. Welcome back. Well, the first big idea that I want to highlight is what I call the big ed tech debate that goes back to 1994 with uh, Richard Clark and Robert Cosma when they engaged in a very public debate, for academics anyways, on the effectiveness of educational technology and multimedia learning that's famous in ed tech circles at least. And to summarize the debate, from my perspective anyways, uh, while the passage of time has been kind to the pro-technology arguments of Cosma, it is important to remember that Clark was correct in arguing that no matter what new educational technology we use, if we don't also change the pedagogy, the educational outcomes will stay the same. So if we're using a digital projector, that's great. But if we're using it the way we used an overhead, old overhead projector, then the learning outcomes aren't going to change. We need to find new teaching methods that will take advantage of the technology to improve the learning outcomes for learners. Another big idea is privacy, safety, and consent, especially with social media and the internet. Uh, it's so easy to share, which is wonderful, but we need to make sure that the privacy, safety, and consent issues are taken into account. Next big idea is open educational resources. And especially if you're new, a newer teacher, uh, being able to use quality educational resources that other educators have made available free and charge is a huge benefit. Uh, there are so many new things coming at you as you start to teach in your first and second years of school that being able to uh, find a curriculum that's close to what you want, maybe modify it or tweak it a bit to customize it and uh, localize it can be helpful, but you can save so much time by doing, uh, doing this and then share back what you, the improvements you've made just to be a good uh, community member. Next big idea is multimedia and creation learning. So as educators, we can create multimedia videos and other things for our learners. Uh, we can also encourage them to create on their own. So not only do they uh, are able to learn the tool, like a video editor, for example, or Canva for layout and design, but they can also help instruct and share other people and make the, that learning visible in a meaningful way rather than uh, just having what I like to call garbage can assignments that the teacher sees, the learner sees, and no one else except for maybe the parents see, or at least have that option. Next is equity and access to tech. Um, we want to make sure that everyone has the tools that they need to be able to learn if they are any Anything that, uh, if a person has difficulty reading, for example, we want to make sure we have the technology available to help them be able to read, whether that be screen readers or voice to text or text to voice. We also need to make sure that we aren't using a teaching methodology like flipped learning, for example, and, um, and expect people to be able to watch videos at home because they may not have access to either the internet bandwidth or a device to be able to watch a video if it's a family with multiple people sharing a, a one or two devices. So another big idea. Next, it's really important to be able to evaluate ed tech tools. Uh, we've spent a little bit of time looking at SAMR and sections, which can be great for helping to remind us of the things we need to keep in mind you know, when we look at new technology. And I encourage you to make a note of these so that when you do get a new tech that looks really cool, you can critically evaluate it. And not just use it because it's new, but use it because it will enable you to do something that 
you know, pen and paper or a nature walk cannot do for you. Um, and then computational thinking. Um, we, we did some coding at the same time using Scratch and other tools, but uh, fundamentally computational thinking is what we're helping our, uh, our learners to do more effectively so that they can break down po problems into smaller chunks, possibly solve them, uh, have some metacognition around how they are able to um, yeah, break down those problems into chunks and solve them and figure out what's important and what's not as important, uh, which are great life skills, not just for coding, but for problem solving in general. And then multi-access and flipped learning. Um, this is a great one, especially uh, hopefully we don't have to do emergency online or remote learning anytime in the near future, but it is something that we can uh, used to differentiate learning for our learners. Um, if people aren't able to make it to the classroom for some reason, whether it be family or health-related issue, um, it can be helpful. Uh, and depending on the age group, flip learning can also help differentiate and let people at, who are maybe struggling a bit review um, review the, the lessons you've got and get that information at their own pace rather than having to try to keep up with the class. Or on the other end, allow students who are maybe more familiar with the subject to go ahead and do uh, more detailed, um, a little more advanced things, um, just so that they stay interested and engaged. And inquiry and access is another key thing. We want to encourage inquiry sorry, inquiry and assessment. We want to encourage an inquiry, but inquiries uh, aren't like a multiple choice uh, test where you you know just check off whether they got the correct answer right. Uh, it's a little more subjective. And so the different types of feedback that you can do so that you give people feedback more quickly, more personalized, and in some cases doing some peer and self-assessment can be great to so that you're not having to assess absolutely everything at a detailed level uh, all the time, but give the learners feedback that will help them grow and progress. And then lastly, what we're covering today, gamification and education, looking at best practices if you're trying to create an educational game or just evaluate educational games that you encounter to see if they'd be appropriate uh, for your learners at their age level and what they're you're trying to help them achieve.